Hello students, so we will discuss another neurological emergency meningitis encephalitis presenting in ED emergency department. So bacterial meningitis or viral encephalitis are life threatening infection and inflammation of central nervous system. Right? Now meningitis is an inflammatory process, inflammatory process uh, of the membranes that surround the brain and spinal cord. Meningitis is, is infection or inflammation of uh, meninges that is surrounding the brain and spinal cord. Right? And encephalitis is infection of brain parenchyma causing inflammation within CNS and is more often viral in origin. Right? It can be caused by variety of viral pathogen right uh, like including HSV is one of the virus infection causing encephalitis is one of the most treatable cause so it is of most importance to us okay now it is very difficult to distinguish between meningitis and encephalitis in emergency department it is difficult to differentiate between both of them because their presentation is mostly the same similar presentation right so, management is mostly guided to us both empirically, okay. What do we do in whenever I get a patient of most probable of bacterial meningitis or encephalitis in whom we are suspecting a CNS infection? Like any other patient, we go for initial evaluation and primary survey. So, ill appearing patient, right, patient who is not looking good in appearance with suspected CNS infection is showing fever, meningi fever, signs of neck rigidity, right, altered consciousness and they are ill appearing. Should be very promptly evaluated. I will tell you, we will discuss in the further slides what is the line of evaluation in these patients and monitored and treated appropriately. Fast management is the crux of saving life of these patients. So they should be promptly evaluated, monitored for any change in their situation and they should be treated appropriately. If the patient has a rapidly declining consciousness, patient is deteriorating very fast, then the focus should be in primary survey, right? Patient actually can present as a wide different, can present differently. Patient may be ill appearing but stable. So, them just evaluation and monitoring and management is to be done. But the patient who is rapidly deteriorating, in them we need to do the emergency management first and then evaluated and accordingly appropriately treated. Right? So, in these patients who are rapidly declining, rapidly deteriorating, we have to prioritize A, B, C. So, patients who are rapidly deteriorating, airway, breathing, circulation should be prioritized. So, stabilization of airway, breathing, circulation is done as any critically ill patient, right? If bacterial meningitis is the likely diagnosis, most probable diagnosis is bacterial meningitis, right? Antibiotics should be immediately administered if possible after prompt lumbar puncture so it is if it is possible we do a prompt lumbar puncture and then give an antibiotic therapy because when the gram staining of the csf would be done we can direct our antibiotic therapy accordingly so before empiric antibiotic a lumbar puncture and a blood culture if possible can be done but definitely if, if this will delay the therapy, if this will delay the therapy, then we don't wait, right? We don't wait. We administer antibiotic as fast as possible, okay? In emergency department, typically we don't know the pathogen patient has come from where. So, a broad specific empiric antimicrobial coverage is recommended. A broad spectrum antibiotic is recommended, okay? If it is uh, like uh, the emergency medicine providers are suspecting viral encephalitis, I will tell you there are few things which can help us in differentiating bacterial meningitis and viral encephalitis. If the likely diagnosis is going towards viral encephalitis, 
then that is patient has suspected CNS infection, altered mental status and focal neurological deficit. Then antiviral therapy, acyclovir therapy in HSV encephalitis should be immediately started. It is very important to remember that therapy in the acute stage is most most advantageous for the patient and the survival of the patient is dependent upon that. So, if a viral nephrophytis is suspected, then definitely HS, IV acyclovir should be started. Now, let us discuss, this is the initial management, let us discuss few things about the clinical features of these both conditions. What is the clinical feature of patients with meningitis? The classical triad of meningitis, patient has fever, patient has neck stiffness and altered mental status. Though must tell you that various studies have shown that in not all the patient this classically come together. So definitely diagnosis is difficult to make. Number of times the early symptoms of meningitis is non-specific. Right? Patient will have headache, patient will have nausea and vomiting, patient will have neck pain. So, very non-specific kind of uh, uh, symptoms which makes very challenging to diagnose this bacterial infection or viral encephalitis. Bacterial infection of meninges or viral encephalitis. Now, patient also may come with a confusion, altered mental status, seizure as the disease progress. So initially, they have non-specific symptoms. Later on, when they are coming, they have more symptoms which are more, which need some more uh, rapid management like confusion, altered mental status, seizure, etc. As the disease is progressing, right? So a thorough history of the current event is very important in these patients. If we take the history very properly, how the condition progressed we would get a very good idea that what the patient has come up to, right? And one more important thing that extremes of age, that is very old patient and young patient, child, children, an immunocompromised patient also present very differently, very vague symptoms, very subtle presentation, very difficult to diagnose. Number of times meningitis patient does not even have fever. So again, the diagnosis becomes very difficult. Chief complaint in uh, infant can number of times only be irritability, lethargy, poor feeding, rash or signs of raised ICP like bulging fontanel. So non-specific patient, the infant may not have a fever, will just be irritable, would just have a tendency towards poor feeding, may be lethargic, may have a rash, or for maybe have, may have a bulging fontanelle. Sometimes this also not is there. Seizure may be the presenting symptoms, right? So pediatric patient number of times seizure is the presenting symptoms. In older age group, number of the most common presenting symptoms is altered mental status, right? Altered mental status. This this is the chief complaint. Okay. Uh, the clinical presentation of encephalitis is similar to meningitis. Only in encephalitis, there may be uh, presence of, along with presence of altered mental status, there may be uh, neurological symptoms, right? Meningitis, focal neurological symptoms less. And if there are focal neurological symptoms, it is more pointing towards encephalitis, right? What are the physical findings in these patients? Common physical findings include febrile patient, although patient will most of the time the patient will have fever, although studies have shown that meningitis and encephalitis without fever, right? So it cannot be that if there is no fever, it is diagnostic that patient does not have infection, brain infection. It can be without fever fever also. Remember in extremes of age and in immunocompromised patient, lack of fever is very common, right? The classically described meningeal findings like knuckle rigidity, neck stiffness, right? Severe neck stiffness, 
due to meningeal irritation. So patient may have, we may during physical examination see neck stiffness, right? Again, this may not present be present in every patient. There are a few ex uh, examination which is done like Koenig sign, Brudis's key signs which is seen for diagnosing the meningeal irritation. Koenig sign, what is done in Koenig sign? Hip is flexed and knee is extended. Flexion of neck, of flexion of hip and extension of knee. This starts pain in back and legs, right? Both Koenig signs or Brudis's key sign, both are non-specific. In Brudis and key sign, there is a passive flexion of neck. Passive when the neck is passively flexed, there is a flexion of hip. Hip is flexed, right? These are also non-specific signs. It is not that if they are absent, patient may not have bacterial meningitis or encephalitis. They are non-specific. They may be present. They may not be present. Neck stiffness is also only present in 30% of the patient with bacterial meningitis or encephalitis. Now, along with these physical findings, when a examination of the patient is being done, there may be presence of petechia, rash, etc., which is very commonly associated with meningococcal meningitis, right? However, it may also be present with other meningitis. Altered mental status, focal neurological findings, right, should point towards encephalitis more than meningitis, okay? So, whenever I get these patients, I have a patient with fever, altered mental status, focal neurological signs, we can go for lumbar puncture. Immediately, we can go for lumbar puncture and then we can give antibiotic to our patient in broad spectrum antibiotic. Now, lumbar puncture is the preferred diagnostic procedure and it is like, it is good, it is preferable if prior to lumbar puncture, we do a CT scan to rule out any intracranial pathology. Since presentation of meningitis, encephalitis is very similar to number of intracranial pathology like ICH, subarachnoid hemorrhage or mass, cerebral mass, etc. So, we have to rule out all these conditions. So, a CT scan is done to rule out these conditions, right? So, CT scan should be considered if patient has, always should be considered if patient has altered mental status, a new onset seizure, patient is immunocompromised, focal neurological deficit or papilledemia patients in the patient prior to lumbar puncture. Okay. Lumbar puncture, how is the lumbar puncture done? In case of suspected bacterial meningitis or encephalitis, four tubes of CSF is each containing one ml of fluid is typically obtained, right? What are the initial CSF laboratory studies which are done? First tube is used for cell count and differential of cell count. Second tube for protein and glucose. Third for gram stain and fourth for bacterial culture, right? Now, number of condition in which it may be required to do an additional CSF studies, right? The number of patients, features in them prompt us towards some particular pathogen. So, in CSF, we can study those pathogens also. Additional CSF studies is required, may be required in immunocompromised patient, right? Or if a CNS infection is suggested based on initial laboratory testings, right? So, when we do a lab test, it points towards certain pathogen. So, we can go for that pathogen also, like patient has a history of tuberculosis, etc. So, we can go for those specific tests also in CSF, right? So, uh, other CSF studies which we can do is HSV or enterovirus PCR, right? Bacterial antigen testing or specialized fungal testing, right? If patient is immunocompromised and most likely pathogen we are we are suspecting is fungus. So, we can also go for specialized fungal testing in CSF, bacterial antigen testing in CSF, right? So, these can be done, okay? Now, patient present with elevated or possible CNS infection, most of them, right? We should have a 
कंप्लीट सी बी सी प्रोफाइल डन कंप्लीट ब्लड काउंट डन ग्लूकोज एलेक्ट्रोलाइट यूरिया नाइट्रोजन क्रियाटनी बेसिक लेबोरेटरी इन्वेस्टिगेशन इज मस्ट राइट नो वन मेजर प्रॉब्लम इज दैट मोस्ट ऑफ द लेबोरेटरी इन्वेस्टिगेशन आर नॉन स्पेसिफिक फॉर मैन इंजाइटिस और इनकेफोलाइटिस राइट सो दे आर जस्ट फॉर लेट से पेशेंट वेल बींग बेस लाइन इन्वेस्टिगेशन विच वी आर सींग so none of them are pointing towards a particular pathogen a particular bacteria so normally after take doing all these test we start a broad empiric antibiotic right broad empiric antibiotic is started okay now classically is the what is the csf finding csf finding very fast we we'll just see on the basis of csf how do we dif differentiate between bacterial viral and fungal meningitis bacterial viral and fungal meningitis now remember in viral meningitis the csf pressure is normal elevated in both bacterial and fungal meningitis right in case of uh, wb white blood cells total tlc in csf it is highly elevated in bacterial meningitis and less in viral and fungal meningitis neutrophils differential count more than 80% of the wbc present in the csf would be neutrophils in bacterial meningitis right viral and fungal meningitis it would not be neutrophils then glucose is reduced glucose is reduced in bacterial meningitis and it is normal in viral meningitis and may be reduced in fungal meningitis as well protein is elevated in bacterial meningitis normal in viral meningitis and elevated in fungal meningitis also and gram staining in bacterial meningitis will be bacterial it will be positive for the bacterial so we'll get tria in gram staining for bacterial meningitis so mostly total tlc count differential count and glucose and protein level right glucose is reduced in bacterial meningitis and protein is elevated in bacterial meningitis so a very fast csf is report is obtained which can help us in focusing our treatment right now for patient with suspected bacterial meningitis empiric intravenous antibiotic therapy has to be started right and patient should be admitted into the hospital Uh, cns infection suspected meningitis patient needs to be admitted because antibiotic would be given in iv right so patient with severe disease may require icu level care depending upon the clinical circumstances of the patient so they need to be admitted in the hospital because most of them would be given iv drugs now along with broad spectrum antibiotic i would not go into the details of the antibiotic according to the age a broad spectrum antibiotic is given and later on according to the culture we can narrow the spectrum of antibiotic accordingly okay so i would not go into that just i'll say about broad spectrum antibiotic is started and very important treatment of the most cases of cases of encephalitis is supportive care viral encephalitis mostly the management is supportive care right only hsv encephalitis has a specific treatment that is acyclovir intravenous acyclovir so it should be started as fast as possible intravenous acyclovir should be started as fast as possible in case of suspected encephalitis okay now there is a recommendation that uh, patients we are starting with antibiotics they should also receive a uh, adjunctive corticosteroid treatment it has shown some clear cut benefit in these patients so it should be started before or along with the first dose of antibiotic yeah we have to start corticosteroid along with the first dose of antibiotic or before starting the antibiotic this has decreased studies have shown that it has decreased the mortality and neurological sequelae for the subset of the patient with bacterial meningitis right so 
some p patients are being benefited in the studies with adjunctive steroid so it is preferable to give steroids in these patients right so consider intravenous dexamethasone every 6 hours for 4 days in adults and children 3 months and older right so children 3 months and older and adults for 4 days dexamethasone 6 hourly is given right in patient who needs CT scan or uh, CT scan of brain prior to LP blood culture should also be drawn right blood culture should also be drawn before giving empiric antibiotic therapy okay now so I have started antibiotic I have given my patient steroid now so I have started a initial management of my patient I have done all the investigations now how I will dispose this patient remember disposition most of these patients are admitted into the hospital for further evaluation and empiric IV. Encephalitis patients also require inpatient treatment, right? Rarely, some well appearing patients of viral meningitis, right, may be suitable for outpatient treatment with a careful return and follow up when required. But most of these patients should be admitted because drugs are given intravenously and deterioration can happen in these patients so they should be always admitted right should be admitted if diagnosis is unclear after emergency evaluation and still bacterial meningitis remains a likely possibility then also patients should be admitted and started on empiric antibiotic treatment right uh, remember that if lumbar puncture results are negative for CSF infection, then other additional inpatient or outpatient diagnostic testing may be done, right? Depending upon the appropriate clinical condition. If lumbar puncture is not showing any infection, but patient is pointing towards spectral meningitis, empiric antibiotic has to be started. And other investigation is done to rule out the other causes, which can be present in these which can be a differential diagnosis of bacterial meningitis and encephalitis. So, disposition is depend upon the patient, right? If the disease is established, then also patient is admitted. If the disease is not established, then also patient is admitted for further management. Okay, thank you.